Well, I'd like to welcome you to this short course. It's a real pleasure to be able to come here and talk about runoff generation in forested watersheds. My name is Jeff McDonald. I'm a professor in the Department of Forest Engineering at Oregon State University and the Richardson Chair in Watershed Science. And my background and interests, not surprisingly, are in runoff generation in forested watersheds. Uh, my PhD is in forest hydrology from the University of Canterbury in, in New Zealand. And uh, I've been working as a professor for the last uh, 15 or 16 years, starting out at Utah State University in Logan in the Department of Forest Resources. And then after that, uh, working at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in upstate New York, and the last five years at, at Oregon State University, where I'm, where I'm at now. So what this course is going to deal with are kind of a, a, a quick summary of uh, the main concepts in runoff generation that many of you are probably already aware of. But I want to bring everyone up to kind of a similar level in terms of some of the uh, well-known assumptions and uh, ideas in terms of how runoff is generated and then start to look at some of the, the newer research that's beginning to challenge the prevailing paradigm that's out there in forest hydrology and how this might influence management issues that you might be facing on your forest. We're not going to tackle applied issues per se, but I, my argument is going to be that understanding these basic concepts is really fundamental to understanding appropriate management solutions. So knowing where water goes when it rains, uh, the residence time of water in your stream and the main flow paths, I think, is a first necessary first step before you can choose an appropriate model or think about how some kind of uh, land use change might impact water quantity or water quality. Uh, what I'll try and do is uh, make reference to some of these different areas where you're working. Um, some of the things that I'll talk about today are actually on this uh, website, and there are course materials that uh, I didn't bring with me. Everyone has a handout. There's a handout here up front if you've come in late and, and didn't get one. This is a set of course notes. But if you're interested in any follow-up, there are some virtual uh, field trips that you can go on. There's a virtual lecture, which is basically a, a quarter, four-credit graduate course version of this uh, particular short course that I give. And this is uh, online. There are a series of benchmark papers that you can download. These are what I consider the benchmark papers in runoff generation and hill slope hydrology, and then other course materials if you're interested in any follow-up uh, afterwards. Now, these benchmark papers uh, are really, I think, the key underpinnings for this, uh, this material. I think a lot of what we do now in research, we sometimes forget maybe what was done before us, particularly if it was before you know, the online version of, of papers. So this uh, set of benchmark papers that you can download kind of looks at a number of uh, key papers and talks about how they laid the foundation for some of our uh, main concepts of, of runoff generation. So you can uh, download that material. If you're new to this field at all, there's some good basic material. Uh, this principles of hydrology would be the main course text used outside the US for teaching this kind of material at the uh, senior undergraduate level. This Water and Environmental Planning by Dunn and Leopold uh, was published in 1978 and up until recently has been the main text in use in the US and it's now been largely supplanted by the Brooks et al text, Hydrology and Management of Watersheds. This came out in 1990, I think, and is now widely used hydrology programs around the country. And this is quite a new book, Elements of Physical Hydrology, uh, by George Hornberger at UVA and, and colleagues there. It's quite good. This is probably the best book of all. Unfortunately, it's in Swedish. Uh, it's used a lot by uh, folks in Europe and in Sweden, not surprisingly. But uh, it's really excellent. Uh, I've only been able to get through the, the figures and figure captions, which are in English, but uh, it's, it's very good. Now, for more advanced material that's come out rather recently, uh, this book, Spatial Patterns in Catchment Hydrology by Roger Grayson and Gunter Bloschel, is really changing the way we view watersheds, going from point measurements of uh, evaporation or infiltration and some of the things that we do as practicing hydrologists to really looking at spatial patterns and how that might uh, inform how a watershed or system might work. The classic in this field is Hill Slope Hydrology by Kirkby, published back in 1978. It's now out of print, but you'll see it in libraries. Uh, this one by Anderson and Burt was uh, 
kind of a, a newer version of hill slope hydrology, came out in the early 90s. If you're interested in rainfall runoff modeling and watersheds, the book is by Keith Bevan at Lancaster, and it's called uh, Rainfall Runoff Modeling the Primer. And then there's, if you're interested in isotope tracing and other uh, more geochemical, biogeochemical aspects of watersheds, uh, this is a book that you could consult. Now in terms of journals, uh, these might be the main journals in relation to runoff generation processes. Uh, the Hydrological Sciences Journal, published by the International Association of Hydrological Sciences. For those in more engineering aspects of watershed hydrology, the ASCE Journal of Hydrologic Engineering. HESS is the European Journal of uh, kind of water resources. It's kind of the European equivalent of water resources research, which is our main journal in the U.S. in terms of uh, water issues. Journal Hydrology is published by Elsevier and is a, a main international journal. And then Hydrological Processes, which publishes more of the mechanistic kind of process-oriented papers. And if you're interested in any information on these journals, then do talk to me at the coffee breaks and I can, uh, I can give you some background or information since I have a little bit of uh, association with some of these, well, these journals. So what we're going to look at this morning are basic questions. These are the basic questions, I think, that are not only fundamental to how we manage watersheds, but also some of the issues that interlink water quantity, water quality. These are important for understanding where debris flows might occur. This might influence the spatial pattern of vegetation if we're in water-stressed environments. It might determine the dissolved load in a stream. These basic questions of where water goes when it rains or when the snow melts, I know a lot of you come from snow melt dominated places, uh, how long does it reside in the catchment and what flow path does it take to the stream? So the flow path might determine how labile nutrients like dissolved organic carbon or nitrate are flushed along the way. The residence time might determine uh, how things that are weathered in the soil profile are then moved into the stream and contact time in the subsurface is really a first order control on the dissolved load or the, the geochemical uh, constituents in the stream. Now traditional forest hydrology has taken an approach using the paired watershed approach and many of you would be familiar with this, many of you are involved in, in paired watershed studies where one has a control, this is a slide from the H.J. Andrews experimental forest in Oregon where one might have a control and then different treatments. Uh, could be different forest treatments or including forest roads. And one might look at the outlet response then after a, a period where these were gauged simultaneously for some years prior to treatment. And then you would use statistical analysis to see if there are significant differences in peak flows or sediment concentrations or what have you. Now, this is still a viable approach and this is still a, a useful thing to do, but it does have limitations. And this has been nicely summarized in this paper uh, uh, this year in Water Resources Research. And th the bottom line is that this is often a very black box technique. We look at what comes out at the bottom, but we won't really know why or why not these changes might have occurred because we're really looking at the system as a as a, as a black box and we're not peering inside the box to illuminate these questions of flow pathways, residence time, and flow sources. So we're really relying on statistical tests and if, as many of you might be aware of in your work, often the results can be highly equivocal. You know, there are a lot of papers in the literature that are contradicting each other in terms of forest treatment effects because of some of these issues. Uh, hydrological differences between control and treatment that may or may not be apparent prior to the, uh, prior to the uh, experiment. Climate variations through time that might influence the control, often a short length of pre and post treatment record that makes it difficult statistically. If you're looking at peak flows and you've got, uh, oh, even a couple of decades of record and you only have a few events of a certain magnitude through that period, to focus on, let's say, harvesting effects on peak flow, that can be very difficult to, uh, to really quantify. And then this black box na nature. So this isn't a slam on the paired watershed approach that we're going to go through today, but what I'm offering is sort of a, a complement to it, a way to peer inside how we might uh, look at paired watershed studies. 
So what we're going to do after we do a, an overview of the main concepts of runoff generation is really try to uh, look at these different scales going from plot scale to hill slope scale to catchment scale to understand what might be the main drivers at this scale. I think when you look in the journal literature and some of those uh, more advanced texts, you find oh, a, whole, a whole myriad of, of process descriptions that really show how complex the plot scale is, how complex lateral flow to the stream is, how incredibly heterogeneous and complex catchments are. And what we're going to try and do is whittle down some of that complexity and think about what might be some of the first order controls on what generates runoff in, in different environments. But we'll, we'll look explicitly at these different scales to think about how processes in a 1D way trigger lateral flow in a kind of a 2D way and how these different landscape elements combine to give an integrated response at the catchment outlet. So this is kind of the, the framework for what we'll go through this morning. So, as I said, we're not going to tackle applied problems per se, but I'm hoping that as we go through, if you have any questions or you've got an idea in relation to uh, a problem that you might be working on, certainly interrupt me as we go through. And I think the more interaction we can have through the morning, the better. But what we're going to look at are, are some of the internal mechanisms. Some of the internal mechanisms of uh, flow path, rate of water flux, the geographic source of water contributing to water in the stream. And I think if we're looking, for instance, at, oh, I don't know, how forest roads might affect the plumbing of a watershed, knowing something of what turns on and off hill slopes in often very threshold-like ways can be important for thinking about what might be the hot spots for where one might have cut bank interception of subsurface flow. Or, for instance, knowing how hill slope and, say, riparian zones connect and disconnect on the time scale of events might greatly influence how we think about stream temperature issues in relation to riparian zone management. Or if we're looking at how fire might affect runoff generation and hydrophobicity associated with uh, fire, I think it's important to know what the mechanisms might have been prior to that and perhaps how the longevity of that uh, hydrophobicity influences the altered runoff regime. So we're not going to be talking about these applied issues, but they're in the back of our minds, and I'd like you to raise them as questions if you, uh, if you have them as we go along. Now, why these mechanisms are important, uh, we learned in the late 1970s and early 80s that the flow pathway through the soil really controls the chemistry of water in the stream. Back in acid rain days, when Charlie Driscoll at Syracuse University was leading a number of teams looking at uh, acid deposition in the Adirondacks and the Northeast US, Scandinavia, Southern uh, Quebec and Ontario, it was crystal clear that if you identified areas maybe where there are some deeper flow paths uh, controlling flow in the stream, then those were often the refuge for uh, fish species that were seeking out more circumneutral waters. Now, along, if you follow along a, a stream channel, it's not as though that the contributions to flow along the channel, either during events or between events, are uniform along that length. Clearly, there are hot spots associated with, you know, topographic depressions, groundwater seepages, jointing, and so on in the bedrock. And if you look at the water age or the flow path length, there's a direct correlation often to the base cation, base anion concentrations, pH if you're in more acidic uh, terrain. So this is one reason why understanding flow pathways might be important. Another issue is uh, that of water residence time. How old is the water? How long does the water reside in the subsurface? These are uh, age data on the y-axis. Uh, working with the USGS group at, uh, out of Reston. Doug Burns is at the New York office in Troy. And along with uh, uh, colleagues at Reston, Virginia, Neil Plummer in particular, they've used chlorofluorocarbons to age date groundwaters. These are groundwaters from some wells in an experimental catchment in, uh, at, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. It's a USGS equivalent to perhaps one of your Forest Service experimental basins. And this is showing a striking correlation between, say, silica concentration, sodium concentration, and 
how old that water is. We'll talk about some techniques to actually uh, compute water age a little later on this morning, but this is just trying to make the point that despite the leveraging by this uh, point here, it's still a very strong relation between water age and water chemistry. And again, as we go through, please interrupt me with any questions you might have. If I'm using terms or jargon that's uh, unfamiliar, I certainly don't want that to, to uh, create any difficulties as we go through. So call me on any terms or uh, Canadian pronunciations that you might not be uh, getting. Now, what we're going to cover and what we're not going to cover, we'll, we'll really try to look at these scales from maybe, uh, you know, the plot scale, hill slope, catchment, but we're, we're not going to address the regional scale. We won't look really deep into the subsurface at hydrogeological problems and issues, although this is clearly important. It's beyond the scope of this course. Similarly, in terms of uh, uh, time scales, we'll focus mostly on events and we'll look much less at uh, seasonal and long-term variations. So it's going to be events that are our focus, and we're going to look at the kind of scales from the plot up to the experimental catch.